Welcome. I think I'd like to get started. Looks like most people have come into the room now. Welcome to those in the audience and also our online viewers. My name is Carrie Jennings. I'm the Research and Policy Director at Freshwater. You will have interacted probably with a lot of our other staff here, Executive Director, um, other staff who are in the room. We all welcome you. Um, and as does our co-sponsor, the College of Biological Sciences. So I want you to take a moment now and refer to the handout that you got because on the back of it is the way we would like you to participate. And the very first thing we would like you to do is to open Pigeonhole Live, www.pigeonhole.at, and enter the passcode MOOS, M-O-O-S, the name of this lecture series. And there will be a place where you can record what your role is here, citizen or public uh, a professional in water. And our speaker has requested that people do this poll first so that he kind of can pitch the talk directly at you so he knows who is, who is in the room. And I'm going to show you right now who is in the room. So it looks like people have already started part participating. We've got water resource professionals, academics. Great. So you can also use this app during the talk to record your questions, to vote for other people's questions, and I think that's all we can do there, right? And that will guide the panel discussion afterwards, which will be hosted by the College of Biological Sciences Dean Valerie Forbes. But what I want to do right now is welcome Dr. Jeremy Guest. You would not believe how long it took him to get here. <laughs> from Champaign. He probably could have taken a sleigh and made it more quickly. But Jeremy is the assistant professor in the Department of Civil, Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And as you note from his abstract, his research focuses on the development of technologies for sustainable water and sanitation in both technologically advanced communities like Minneapolis, but also in developing communities around the world. He and his group integrate experimentation, modeling, and sustainable design in their work. He has a lot of accolades. He serves as the environmental sustainability lead for the Soybean Innovation Lab. He is the sustainable design lead for the Center for Advanced Bioenergy and Bioproducts Innovation, and is the thrust leader for sanitation and resource recovery for the Safe Global Water Institute. He has already received an, a career award from NSF, an Early Career Development Program Award the Paul Bush Award for Innovation in Applied Water Quality Research from the Water Environment and Reuse Foundation, and is a fellow of the Center for Advanced Study at University of Illinois. So his research has been funded by a variety of different interests, NSF, the EPA, the Department of Ag, Department of Energy, and USAID. Dr. Guest's formal training includes a bachelor's in civil engineering from Bucknell University in Pennsylvania, a master's from the Virginia Tech, and a PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Michigan. So I'd like you all to welcome Dr. Guest. Thank you very much. Thanks. OK, thank you, Carrie. Um, so just to make things difficult uh, for the people in the booth, I'm actually going to wander away from the podium uh, and see if they can keep me on camera. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Freshwater and the College of Biological Sciences. Um, I, I was excited about the opportunity to come here and talk a little bit about resource recovery, which is uh, our top passion in uh, Urbana-Champaign. So, just to, before I get started, I'd like to do acknowledgments. So this is my research group, everything I show you, uh, they're the ones who did it. And in particular, uh, the work I'm gonna show you is led by John Trimmer, he's a PhD student in my group. And in, this is, a lot of this work is in collaboration with Roland Cusick, he's another faculty member uh, at the University of Illinois. And so this work, we have a, a number of sources as Carrie mentioned, but our work related to resource recovery uh, specifically comes from the National Science Foundation, the Water Research Foundation, this uh, Center for Advanced Study, and then uh, I'm going to mention uh, algal technologies at one point from uh, Clear as Water Recovery, and I just want to disclose that I also do some consulting work for them as they try and uh, scale up their uh, algal technology. We do a lot of work in algae. So, uh, I'm an engineer. 
I'm a little introverted. I like that the audience is dark right now. I can't actually see any of you. Um, but basically, you know, I work in bodily waste. This is how I think of all of you. Uh, so uh, you eat and excrete. So um, that's basically it. That's a person. Um, so based on the diet, your diet, uh, your protein intake uh, influences your nitrogen content of your excreta. Uh, you know, whether you uh, consume animal protein or vegetable protein, it should be vegetable protein, but we can talk about that in the panel if you like. Um, but uh, that influences your phosphorus uh, excreta in, in your excreta. And so in essence here, we break it down by the elements of interest. And so uh, your dietary intake will dictate your carbon, uh, how much water you consume uh, in your food and beverage, but also nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are the ones I'm going to focus on for nutrient recovery. So when we look at what the body does with these resources, we're actually very good at metabolizing carbon. So that's where we get our energy. We consume carbohydrates, fats, protein, and our body breaks it down uh, alongside oxygen. And we respire CO2, carbon dioxide, and roughly 2 to 10% of that organic carbon makes its way out uh, the tail end. And so then for water, if we look at water, uh, we excrete basically all, all, all of that in our uh, urine and feces. It depends on your physical activity and um, yeah, how much you actually drink and things like that. But then for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, these, these nutrients relevant to agriculture, we excrete basically all of them in your urine and feces. About 80% of the nitrogen is in urine, the other 20% is in fecal matter. Phosphorus is about 50-50, and then potassium, uh, a lot of it in particular is in urine, but also fecal matter. And we also sweat some of it out, that's why we have some losses for potassium. So if this is basically what you're all doing, uh, you eat these things, excrete them. When we designed our wastewater treatment plants, when we were worried about uh, bodily waste and its impact on the environment, its impact on human health, we were very focused for one on carbon uh, and getting rid of this last two to 10% of carbon. So this last two to 10% of carbon was resulting in basically rivers dying uh, when we released, uh, discharged a lot of uh, bodily waste or wastewater to them. And so we're also worried about solids and pathogens, but wastewater treatment plants were designed uh, with, with carbon in mind uh, to a large extent. And so this, is, this has resulted in uh, the consumption of about 1% to 3% of U.S. electricity is for wastewater treatment, and a lot of that is because of uh, this right here. And so uh, this is a, a bacterial cell, if you haven't seen one before. So, um, and, and what Pac-Man does is, uh, in a lot of cases, takes in this organic carbon, consumes oxygen, and respires. So breathes out CO2 and grows. So just like we do, we take in organic carbon, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2, and we replace cells. And so that's exactly what we're doing in these reactors. And so this is a full reactor. This is an empty reactor. And the wastewater comes in, and we cultivate microorganisms. So we want lots and lots of microorganisms to degrade the organic carbon that's in our wastewater. And the reason it takes so much energy is this is a full reactor. This is empty. So uh, about tw these are about 20 feet deep, plus or minus. And along the bottom here, you see all these pipes. And on every pipe, all these little disks. So these are diffusers. So air just pours out of every single one of those. And so what we're having to do is to push air into 20 feet of water and have it bubble out. And so that consumes tremendous amounts of energy. It's very hard to deliver air under 20 feet of uh, pressure head. And so this is a large part, this is about half the consumption of wastewater treatment plants is just in this aeration. So as we think about this, uh, our treatment plants were really designed with, with solids and pathogens and carbon in mind to try and protect surface waters and groundwaters uh, from that carbon. But we still have nitrogen and phosphorus largely passing through. We remove some uh, with this conventional design, but a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus can still make their way through the plant. And I don't want to just stop here. Like We have our population center, uh, our wastewater headed to the treatment plant, our water resource recovery facility and then our discharge of surface water and groundwater. There are things happening upstream, of course. Um, we have our synthetic fertilizers going to agriculture, our annual monocultures, uh, especially in the United States. And then there's certainly uh, losses, nutrient losses, going to surface waters and groundwaters, of course. Um, what I'm mostly going to focus on today is, is, is this flow up here, though, the population centers going to water resource recovery facilities, and then discharge of those. 
And in particular, like why we care about this nitrogen and phosphorus going to surface waters and groundwaters. So if we look at nitrogen and phosphorus and their impact, uh, you can think at multiple scales. So one would be like the Gulf of Mexico. And so this is a nice image from NOAA, looking at farms and cities, but, and, and things draining toward uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And what ultimately happens is, we, in particular, we have lots of nitrogen running off from our fields. They make, they make their way to the Gulf of Mexico, and we have regularly a very large hypoxic zone. So hypoxic means dissolved oxygen less than two milligrams per liter, which means higher organisms, fish, and things can't live in it. And so we, uh, it's called, in short, a dead zone that floats around in the Gulf of Mexico. And depending on the temperatures and a number of other factors, it changes in size each year. But uh, from the data in 2017, this was for 8,000 square miles, 8,000 square miles of dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And this in large part due to nutrient discharges making their way down, uh, down there. A little closer to home, so rather than all the way down uh, in the south, uh, we've had cyanobacterial blooms, and these occur regularly. Uh, so this is an image from Toledo uh, back in 2014 when there was a cyanobacterial bloom uh, was uh, publicized because it was, the bloom was near the drinking water intake, and the cyanobacteria were excreting toxins. And so cyanobacteria can produce a number of toxins, uh, neurotoxins, they can damage uh, the liver as well, kidneys. And so uh, these cyanobacteria were excreting toxins that made the water unsafe to drink, unsafe to shower in, unsafe to be exposed to. And so as a result, they were handing out large quantities of bottled water for an extended period of time. And uh, there was a, a discussion about, OK, why did this happen? And it's, it's in particular, phosphorus. It's, it's phosphorus in, uh, getting into the uh, receiving waters. Uh, more recently, if you watch the news uh, related to Florida, uh, there have been large-scale cyanobacterial blooms in Florida, in Lake Okeechobee, in the canals, um, and in also along the coasts. And so uh, these uh, cyanobacteria are also releasing toxins, and they've been so bad that uh, people have uh, people have tried to document or have argued that even like being near or being in the proximity of the water and exposure to aerosol particles or uh, volatilized compounds uh, may be impacting people's health. And so uh, there's a lot of attention on this uh, cyanobacterial blooms in Florida and like how to mitigate these. And again, to a large extent, it's coming from uh, agriculture. The phosphorus is coming from agriculture, uh, not necessarily from treatment plants. But because of our regulatory structure, uh, the group that bears the burden of mitigation for nitrogen phosphorus is largely our water resource recovery facilities. Uh, they're point sources. We know where they discharge. They can be regulated. Uh, and so there's this burden on them to take out this nitrogen and phosphorus uh, before it's discharged to surface waters and groundwaters. And whether or not you know, we agree that this needs to happen, like many do agree that it has to happen, there needs to be mitigation. But regardless, this has been the train we've been on for some time. And so if we look at uh, the progression of, of uh, nutrient criteria, so like nitrogen and phosphorus, like limits on different types of waters. And so here we go from a light green, which means some waters have nitrogen and phosphorus criteria, and waters here are like lakes, rivers, they're, they're classifications of water types all the way up to dark green, which means all uh, water types have nitrogen and phosphorus criteria. Um, from 1998 to 2016, you could just see a, a greening of the country. And Minnesota was actually out in front um, on a lot of these issues. But regardless of how you feel about this permitting, uh, it's clear that nitrogen, in particular phosphorus permits, are becoming increasingly common and increasingly strict. And so utilities are having to navigate this and, and, and manage uh, the need to remove additional or remove nutrients from their wastewaters. So when we look at how they do this, uh, in essence, we take nitrogen that's coming into the treatment plant. Uh, we use a nutrient removal technology that removes it as nitrogen gas. So most of the nitrogen coming in, if we have to remove it, and we want very little in the effluent of the treatment plant, uh, we remove nitrogen. We move it as nitrogen gas, and that's 80% of what we're breathing right now is, is N2 gas. So it's not a problem for the atmosphere necessarily, but um, although some of what's emitted is nitrous oxide, uh, which can have greenhouse gas implications, but in terms of the fate of nitrogen as N2, 
as, and two gas, that's not a problem. Uh, the problem is that this consumes uh, energy and in particular a lot of chemicals. So we need infrastructure and we need chemicals to, to make this happen. For phosphorus, uh, to a large extent, we remove it as uh, metal phosphate, so we precipitate it out. Uh, or it can wind up in sludge and really concentrated uh, within the biomass. And in many cases, this winds up in a landfill. Uh, if uh, people wanted to recover it, it could be land applied, but, but in many cases, if you're doing this phosphorus removal, it becomes uneconomical to try and land apply uh, the biomass. But it depends on where you are, it depends on a number of factors, but in many cases, this is gonna wind up in a landfill um, or maybe incinerated and go to a landfill uh, as ash. And utilities are having to bear these costs, and just to give you some sense for order of magnitude, we're talking millions potentially for small utilities, uh, large utilities, if we're talking you know, 20 or more uh, million gallons a day of flow, and so I believe uh, in this area, at least one plant I looked at was about 13 million gallons per day. That's about the size of one of the two plants in Urbana-Champaign as well. Um, but uh, actually, it's gotta be way bigger than that in this area too. But if, if we look at more like 100 million gallons per day, that, or sorry, 100 million dollars or more will be these uh, treatment plants that are doing tens of millions of gallons uh, for, for large or medium-sized cities. And you even have places like Chicago that have a treatment plant that can handle 1.3 billion gallons per day of wet weather flow, 1.3 billion. So that's 100 times bigger than Urbana-Champaign's uh, biggest treatment plant. And so we're talking about very large cost uh, to try and mitigate nitrogen and phosphorus. And so the, what this means largely is infrastructure upgrades. And so if a, if a treatment plant has to achieve now nit nitrogen and phosphorus removal, uh, they may need whole new uh, reactor basins, uh, new unit operations that can be really expensive and require a lot of capital investment. Smaller utilities uh, may not be able to afford this. And so we've seen really small utilities in the Southwest, for example, that have tried to get around the need for phosphorus removal by even just building more ponds and then ending in unlined ponds with a hope for infiltration and, and evaporation uh, so that they can avoid discharging to receiving streams. So they're trying to find ways to not discharge phosphorus and they're going as far as just get rid of the water uh, if at all possible and, and either infiltrate into the ground or like have shallow basins and evaporate. So as we think about this nutrient mitigation, so nitrogen and phosphorus coming in and just removing it from the plant, we are missing an opportunity. Uh, because this is a larger system. We, all the way over here, this, this nutrients originate over here with synthetic fertilizers and agriculture. And so we can focus over on the synthetic fertilizers for a second here. So synthetic fertilizers uh, are, are a main input to this uh, process. And where we get nitrogen in particular, so nitrogen fertilizers come from the Haber-Bosch process. So it's an industrial process that can reduce nitrogen from the atmosphere uh, into uh, ammonia, that we can have reduced nitrogen and actually apply it to land. Uh, this consumes a tremendous amount of energy. So uh, we consume a lot of natural gas in particular for this process, but we can make nitrogen fertilizer from the atmosphere. Phosphorus is another story. So phosphate rock is a finite resource and it's actually mined. And the way people talked about peak oil, people have been talking about peak phosphorus. We don't know that that, that'll ever, that time will ever come. Um, but it is becoming, there is a projection that it will become increasingly expensive to harvest uh, rock phosphate uh, because we're depleting the most accessible supplies of, of phosphate rock. And most of the uh, known phosphate rock is in Morocco and then a lot in the United States and China. And there are a uh, handful of other countries that are reasonable size exporters of phosphate rock. But um, they point to phosphate in particular as this concentrated reserve um, is sitting in Morocco and so are we going to have similar challenges that uh, we've had oil, that it's geographically uh, isolated supply. Another is the, the uh, potash ore uh, for our potassium and this is again another finite resource that has to be mined. And so if we want potassium for our crops, uh, it has to be pulled out of the ground and consumed and it's ultimately in our model of, of how resources flow through our system uh, all of these mined resources, either we have nitrogen, which is going to consume energy, or we have phosphorus and potassium, they're going to make their way to ground and surface waters or make their way to ground and surface waters uh, and ultimately out to the ocean. And so we're going to lose them. And so instead of that, what if uh, we try and recover the nitrogen, the phosphorus, potassium, reduce reliance on synthetic fertilizers, and at the same time prevent them from being discharged? 
and try and close this loop. And this is, in general, an idea along the lines of the circular economy. So that phrase in particular is really common in Europe. It's been pushed for some time now. But this idea that there should be no cradle to grave. Instead, everything should be cradle to cradle. So when we uh, generate a resource or we use a resource, we should have its end of life in mind so that it can become that resource anew, can become that resource again. And so this is, this is what we'll think about here for a second, this nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium recovery for agriculture. And so back to our, well, to you. Uh, and so we have the carbon, water, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Uh, you excrete it out, and then we have technology. So technology is where it comes in, and we can recover these resources. And this gives you some sense for the amount of these resources, the quantity that we can actually recover. Uh, and it depends on, in particular, diet, but also the t technologies that we use. And so in the U.S., we're on the higher end of all of these uh, because we have relatively high caloric intake. So some of the smaller numbers are going to be from countries with, uh, the, that have extreme poverty uh, and very low caloric intakes and low access to protein as well. Um, so we're gonna, we tend to be over here on the right side um, on average in the U.S. And so what, what can we do with these resources? So if we have this much like uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and, and in the uh, panel I'm happy to talk, we can certainly talk about energy as well um, and, and water, but let's focus for a second here on, on NPK, so nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So one potential use is that we can leave them in the water. Okay? So we have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium already dilute in water, and we can take that nutrient-rich water and we can use it to irrigate. And this would be called fertigation. So you actually have fertilizer in with your irrigation, so you're using this nutrient-rich recovered water to irrigate crops. And that's, that's one potential uh, path forward. And we might even be able to do this in like dense or more urban environments uh, to cultivate like nutrient-intense crops uh, to try and add value to this, this resource while simultaneously removing nutrients. Another one that we usually don't talk about or call fertigation would be microalgae. So I mentioned my group does a lot of work on this. And just like with any other wastewater treatment process, our main value proposition here is phosphorus removal. So it's actually recovering the phosphorus uh, from the wastewater so you have a better effluent quality. But you can cultivate algae, and algae's already been like a $5 billion a year industry in the US for as a soil amendment, but you can also use it for other uh, end uses as well. So if we move past fertigation, so one, we took the, uh, the water that was available, and now we move on to uh, biosolids. So one of the most common ways to recover nutrients uh, are, are biosolids, and so that biomass that we grow, those Pac-Men, so lots and lots and lots of Pac-Men, uh, we stabilize them, we make sure that they're biologically safe, and uh, they can make their way uh, to land. And so these are just a, a couple images of it. In practice, it can be injected below the surface or uh, spread. Uh, that's not very good spreading, it's not a great picture, but you can see the <laughs> material. Um, so, biosolids, this is commonly done. This is done in a lot of places in the U.S. Um, and uh, in many cases, it's on non-arable land, so it's not on cultivated land, or it's uh, and less so on, on uh, crops, on actual crops. And even then, uh, I believe it's mostly for uh, animal feed, not for human consumption. Um, and so, if we get move past biosolids and we want to start talking about something a little more like a synthetic fertilizer, we can talk about crystal products. And so, technology is amazing. We can even recover from wastewater something that looks just like a fertilizer you would get in a Scott's fertilizer bag. So you go to the hardware store, or, uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, yeah, and, and you get out your Scott's fertilizer, and it's going to be this uh, pelleted material. So we can make that at a wastewater treatment plant. And like the most common in the U.S. and well, North America and Europe is called ammonium struvite. Uh, and so it's magnesium, ammonium, phosphate. Uh, and so we have our nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, more recently, uh, it's what's being called potassium struvite. We're just calling it that, I think, for convenience. But uh, it's replacing the potassium uh, instead of ammonium. And so uh, this is being explored. It is not at scale, but ammonium struvite is. And so there are companies out there like Ostara uh, who's been doing this at a very large scale and is uh, generating struvite and across their installations for on the order of about, uh, I think, uh, 14 million people, essentially, of, of, of waste, worth of wastewater. And so we can actually recover crystal products. And so that's promising and, and the potential to offset um, fertilizer use. Something that may be a little less palatable, uh, we could just take urine. 
So if we just wanted to separate out the urine, uh, you can disinfect it and dilute it and potentially spread it. So this is from the Rich Earth Institute in uh, Vermont. And so uh, they're big proponents of this uh, and have lots of literature and, and, and data on uh, recovering uh, urine. We also look to urine and even fecal matter in developing communities. And so uh, we do what's called uh, container-based sanitation. So this is from a company called Sanergy. And uh, they do container-based sanitation, fecal matter and urine. And uh, by keeping them separated, they can be treated separately, managed separately. You can recover energy potentially from the fecal matter and ultimately nutrients. But the urine is 80% of the nitrogen, about half your phosphorus. And you can recover those with a little bit of sterilization. And so uh, here, like we have the potential too to put these toilets in places that don't readily have access to sanitation. Uh, and achieve resource recovery at the same time. So those seem, may seem very far away. Here's something that may look a little closer. Uh, so here's uh, a building concept out of Switzerland from EAVOG, the Swiss Aquatic Research Institute, and it's called NEST. And so the idea here is to come up with basically autonomous buildings uh, that are self-sustaining. And if we uh, look within NEST uh, at their water hub, what it means is separation of gray water, fecal matter and urine, and they're gonna take the gray water and treat it for reuse in the building, fecal matter for energy production and heat in the building, and urine as a fertilizer that they can then send to agriculture. And so the idea here is that not only do these technologies exist, but we have the ability to put them in even the most modern facilities uh, and recover these resources. Not necessarily because Switzerland is in need of access to nitrogen fertilizers or phosphorus fertilizers, but because this just makes sense to do. Uh, and instead of mixing everything together and having it carried uh, through our sores and then having to, be, having to be pulled apart again, just keep them separate from the beginning and it makes treatment easier. So let's take a look now move from Switzerland to something a little more local. So we looked at, uh, my student John uh, looked at what's grown around Minneapolis, St. Paul. And so for the most recent ag data that we had uh, in uh, a radius around Minneapolis and St. Paul, about 54% of the land was corn, 40% soybean, 2.3% oat, 1.5% wheat, and then other crops that fell off below 1%, next potatoes and others. And so if we look at the fertilizer demand or the nutrient demand for these crops. Uh, we can look at nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and how much each crop uh, would potentially, you would potentially apply based on international recommendations. And so we can see that, for example, corn is very uh, nitrogen intensive um, and wheat is very potassium intensive and so on uh, relative to the other crops. And so if we try and understand what this means, if I have bodily waste and I want to apply it to these crops, uh, it means a person, a single person on a U.S. diet uh, can fertilize about 330 square meters of corn, 206 square meters of soybean, 535 square meters of oat, and 375 square meters of wheat. So if you wanted to do that, uh, you could potentially. So uh, we looked at it for my family. Uh, so the four of us, okay, but two are little, so they have lower caloric intakes. And if it's food they don't like, it's a really low caloric intake. <laughs> Um, but let's say we can fertilize about 1,000 square meters of corn. So 1,000 square meters of corn in Urbana-Champaign, it's actually totally doable. So our yard is about 800 square meters. And so really, I just got to convince my wife to buy 200 square meters of prime real estate, like right behind our house, and we're good to go. Like we can fertilize our yard, grow corn, and fertilize the whole thing. That's great. Um, so we live in Urbana-Champaign though, right? So we like to say I back up to like a 50 acre park and then after that uh, it's corn on one year and next year it's soy. So that's, that's it as far as you can see. So Minneapolis, St. Paul, if we go back to there again, so we have a higher population now. Um, so this is what we're showing you now is actually nitrogen. So the potential reuse of nitrogen from, from Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, and so here we have uh, the city center and these are estimates of the city extants based on like a, an algorithm that we that John wrote um, and then here we have uh, distance and the orange here is the uh, nitrogen application potential to cropland based on the crops that were grown in that grid cell and their nutrient demands and so we did this also for phosphorus and potassium but here you can see so the further as you get further outside the city it's getting a little more orange because they're more nutrient intensive crops 
uh, the further you get. And, and they're, in, they're uh, more dense. And so for Minneapolis-St. Paul, uh, the average distance, if you were to use up all of your nitrogen, all of your phosphorus, all of your potassium, so for nitrogen, average distance to application is about 21 kilometers. That's not actually that far. Uh, and you could use up basically all of your nitrogen within 50 kilometers. And potassium and phosphorus is even closer. And so 50 kilometers and you've used up the entire city's like recovered resources. But, so hang on, let's rethink this. So Minneapolis, St. Paul, there's a lot of green out here, right? Uh, so as soon as you get outside the city, there's a lot more uh, cropland. But you've exhausted your nutrient supply uh, right outside the, the, the city limits here. And so when we think about what value or uh, what the impact is of recovered resources, we have to take this into consideration. And so I want to zoom out for a second now and, and even look globally. And so when we think about the impact that recovered resources can have, uh, we're going to look at it across every country. And when I say impact, what I mean is the increase from resource recovery, so the amount of fertilizer you could have access to because you did resource recovery, uh, over the projected consumption of fertilizer by that country in the year 2030. Uh, and so if this is a, a number, let's say, for example, my projected consumption is you know, uh, some number 100, then if I can get access to 10 uh, f from resource recovery, this would be 10% is what I would get. 10 over 100, I get 10%. And so what we're going to show here is the shading of every country going from zero to 2%, which means your resource recovery is giving you very little relative to what you already have, to greater than 100%, which means you're doubling access to fertilizer, or you can entirely offset your fertilizer use with recovered resources. And so from, from dark blue to brown. And then we're gonna highlight in particular the least developed countries uh, as classified by the United Nations, and those are the ones in green. And so we're gonna talk about every individual country, but then I wanna specifically talk about ones classified as least developed uh, by the United Nations. And so if we look, start with nitrogen. So as I said, so dark blue means zero to 2%. There's the US. Uh, dark brown means double access to this resource or more. So more than double access. Uh, so resource recovery could offset basically less than 2% of uh, nitrogen in the US, uh, but increase global supply by 11%. And what we show here in parentheses, this is from an uncertainty analysis. So somewhere between a 9 and 16%. But it varies dramatically by where you are. So if you're in a least developed country, this could be much more impactful in terms of increasing access to fertilizer. The story's the same for phosphorus and potassium. So the countries uh, you can see here that could double access to these resources uh, are in, a, in many of the least developed countries. U.S. is dark blue, dark blue, dark blue. We already use a lot of synthetic fertilizer, and so uh, in recovery from our bodily waste would not move the needle dramatically on access or even offsetting a significant amount. But globally, we can look at the impact we would have, uh, and it's all on the order of about offsetting 10% plus or minus of these resources. Least developed countries, you could either increase access by 65% or offset 65% of nitrogen, 68% of phosphorus, and 150%, 149% of potassium. So that could mean more than doubling. You could have two and a half times as much potassium fertilizer if you were to do resource recovery in least developed countries. And so when we think about resource recovery, having a conversation about resource recovery, implications of resource recovery, we got to think about context. And so this, this first example on the left here, uh, this is a photo from some of my collaborators in, in, as part of the Soybean Innovation Lab in Ghana. And this is a local smallholder farmer's soybean field. Uh, and this is our test site down the road. And our test site uses 60 kilograms of P205 per, uh, per hectare. And so with a little bit of phosphorus, uh, and a few other best practices, you could dramatically increase soybean yields. Uh, and that has real value to people. And so when we talk about increasing access to fertilizers, it's not just about increased access to food supply. It's about increasing crop yields, but then the potential to sell those crops and have another source of income. That ha has tremendous perceived value in these communities. In the US, it's going to be something different. It's not going to be the same storyline. And so when we think about nutrient limits becoming increasingly common and increasingly strict, then the value proposition of resource recovery can be the ability to generate revenue to offset 
upgrades or to come up with new technologies that have potential to be cheaper than the upgrades they're already facing. And so it's still an economic case. It's just instead of the individual experiencing uh, increased yields, now we're talking about the generation of a product for a utility that could offset costs that they're going to have to incur, uh, whether they like it or not. And so that's where I, that's where I want to wrap up, uh, is that this resource recovery in particular, this idea that we can recirculate nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium back to agriculture, uh, it has tremendous potential specifically because it can align goals for environmental protection and taking those nutrients like, and preventing them from going to the aquatic environment, from uh, recovering finite resources like potassium and phosphorus, but it's aligning those goals with goals for economic development. We can create new businesses, new technologies, local products that can go back to agriculture, increase revenue or offset other expenses. And so that's the value proposition is really important to understand, but it's largely driven by like economics. And it depends on where you are, what, what that articulation sounds like. And so I'm happy to talk about any of these, as I'm sure some of the, the panelists uh, have more expertise in some of these than I do. Um, and uh, this idea that uh, we have the potential to recover resources and have an impact both locally, but even globally, uh, to transform or better connect our population centers with ag. So thanks very much for your attention. Okay, now is your chance to open that app again and vote for the questions that you would like to have advanced. We are going to have a stage change up here, a brief intermission while we bring up four chairs for our panelists and our facilitator. Um, Dean Valerie Forbes will be facilitating the panel discussion and taking your questions. She is the Dean of the College of Biological Sciences and also a professor in ecology, evolution, and behavior. Her PhD is from the State University of New York at Stony Brook, and her research goals are to understand how responses to environmental stress, such as toxic chemicals, link across levels of biological organization from molecular to ecosystem level, and to use such understanding to improve ecological risk assessments and environmental management. Most of her work has involved aquatic invertebrates, and in particular animals that live in and feed on sediments, since this is where many of the most harmful chemicals concentrate. She is also a member of our Freshwater Board and is on the policy committee, so I get to interact with Valerie quite a bit, and I'm really happy for that opportunity. And I feel a little guilty because I wonder if the professors in her own school know her as well as we seem to at Freshwater. So if we could just take a break here while the chairs come up and make our, our panelists make their way to this stage. All right, thank you for your patience as we reorganize the living room here. Um, we should be getting a couple more microphones so we don't have to uh, shift this one around. While we're waiting for those, I will just uh, introduce our panelists. You've already met Jeremy, um, so I would like to introduce Paige Novak on the end. Dr. Novak is a professor in environmental engineering in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering at the U of M. She's all, she also co-directs Minnesota's Discovery Research and Innovation Economy, known to its friends as MinDrive, uh, in the MinDrive Initiative, Advancing Industry, Conserving Our Environment. Dr. Novak's area of interest is in the biological transformation of hazardous substances in sediments. We have sediments in common. I like that. Groundwater and wastewater, and particularly how engineers can influence this process. Uh, in the middle, we have Mary Rogers. Dr. Rogers is an assistant professor of sustainable and organic horticultural food production systems in the Department of Horticultural Science at U of M. Her research interests are controlled environment agriculture, urban agriculture, and integrated pest management. In particular, she investigates plant insect interactions and biological and environmental strategies to improve the production of organic vegetables and fruit in the upper Midwest. 
And we have the advantage that all three of our panelists have actually uh, collaborated before and are currently developing a proposal led by Dr. Novak and involving other U of M faculty uh, from their departments, as well as the Department of Mechanical Engineering, the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, and Carlson School of Economics. So this always makes for a more interesting conversation when the panelists uh, know each other and, and can talk together. So with that, and I really can't see, Jeremy wasn't kidding, we can't see any of you. So you could have all gone home and we won't know. But we're gonna have, oh, oh I hear them. We're gonna have a nice conversation up here. Uh, and I get to cheat and see the questions here. Uh, and so let's, let's start. So I think 13 votes means this is the most popular one. Oh, here, ooh, gosh, thanks. What have been the barriers for adopting nutrient recovery in the U.S.? And maybe, Jeremy, you can start with that, and then if either of our other panelists want to chime in. Sure. Uh, so one of, one of the challenges with um, nutrient recovery in general is this idea that um, if a utility is considering doing it, it seems awesome. So you have a technology, it works, I have this product. Uh, and of course people would want to buy it because it's a product and it looks cool. Um, but then you go to talk to farmers and uh, they may have no interest in it whatsoever. So outside Urbana-Champaign, so central Illinois, why do they apply anhydrous ammonia in October? Because it's cheap and so that they don't risk uh, a rainy spring and having to put pushback planting. So if you come up with, oh, I've got this great mineral fertilizer, uh, you can spread it, it's slow release, uh, it, you'll have less runoff, They're like, I, don't, I don't want that. That, so there's been a misalignment of, of, of the products that are developed and then the intended end users. And so one, one way uh, people have been trying to address that is, for example, this company, Ostara, uh, is a large portion of their company is actually agricultural folks and marketing folks. And they focus on creating that market and part of what they bring to bear is, is access to a market. Okay. Paige? One other thing I'd add is that um, the way our regulations are set up, there's not a lot of flexibility typically offered. And so if a utility could remove more mass of a particular um, nutrient, let's say, um, over, the, over a month period, but they can't guarantee that every day they're not going to exceed some concentration-based limit, then they're not able to um, take that risk basically to remove more of the total mass of pollutant because they're they're tied into meeting this this regulation. And so the way that we've set up our, our regulations typically doesn't allow for that flexibility to let utilities experiment and uh, try to get um, a, a better removal of pollutants overall. So that that's another aspect. Hmm. Um, and I, I'm always thinking of fruit and vegetable production, and I think um, there's a real concern from a food safety standpoint about mm -hmm. what, um, what the source of the um, waste is and what potential risks it might have from, um, from bearing you know, human pathogens and yeah. diseases and whatnot. And so actually, I have so many questions for Jeremy after his talk, and I was, I was wondering about, about that kind of aspect. I, I, it might not apply to corn and soybean, but... Um, from a vegetable fruit standpoint, if that's something that you've... Well, and let me add to that, because I was thinking along similar <laughs> lines of other chemicals in wastewater, like pharmaceuticals and other things that we're excreting that aren't nutrients, that don't get degraded in the wastewater treatment plants. So I don't want to rate on your parade, but <laughs> I feel I have to ask that question, which is kind of related to Mary's as well. No, it's a valid question. So, so it depends, <laughs> is, is usually my answer to everything, but it depends. And so when we look at things like, so if there is a concern about that, for example, and we tend toward crystal products, mm. we know what it is. And, and, and it's got a relatively well-defined composition, magnesium, ammonium, phosphate. And so um, you, can, you can concentrate uh, nutrients into lots of different forms. We can come up with concentrated ammonia. Uh, we have the ability to do this. It's just um, whether or not uh, a, a utility is going to pursue that, and then that final product is going to be worthwhile. And so, uh, depending on the circumstances, you know, I, I, I do think we should use, in general, a precautionary principle that we want to make sure we understand the implications of doing something before we do it. Um, but uh, in a lot of cases, we, we have the ability uh, to mitigate these concerns if we're worried about human consumption, for example. 
so we can concentrate the nutrients, can we also purify them? I guess yeah. by these processes. Yeah. 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 That's okay. I, I would add though, with the with respect to the chemicals, um, we've done some work in our lab looking at estrogens and. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey has done a lot of work looking at these compounds, and, and they know that when you apply compounds like uh, pharmaceuticals, estrogens, um, antibiotics, uh, the compounds that are in soaps, um, to farm fields, that they can be picked up by, by vegetables. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of clarity on where those compounds are going to end up. Different mm -hmm. plants will um, collect these in their leaf matter, in their root matter, in the fruits. Different types of carrots will behave differently. And so it can be a, a really challenging thing to try to figure out where these compounds are going to be. And then does it matter? We don't really know if eating a carrot that's got a tiny amount of triclosan in it is going to actually cause harm. But they do know that these can then collect in, in earthworms right. um, from eating the soil. And, and so I think that there is reason to think about it mm -hmm. and, and to worry about it. And, and um, you know, you, you talk about urine um, and how it has most of the nitrogen and half the phosphorus. It also then tends to have a lot of these pharmaceutical compounds. It has a lot of the estrogens that, that um, come from females. Um, hormones in general. And so that can also be something that if you're going to just spread these comp um, urine, untreated urine or sterilized urine um, on a field, I, I would mm. think about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right, good. Let's go to the next question. What is the energy cost associated with resource recovery and can resource recovery be conducted using energy generated from the waste that is being recovered? It's a two-parter. Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> um, well, I, I'll, I'll address it in a non-numerical way, I guess. Um, the, depending on the uh, strength of the wastewater, different wastewaters are more or less concentrated, you can actually recover a fair amount of energy from those waste, uh, waste products, especially if you're looking at um, a more concentrated material from, say, an industry. Um, there are some industries in the Twin Cities area, I think about 15% of the, of the industrial dischargers to the Twin Cities uh, Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is a, around 180 million gallons a day of flow. So it's a huge flow. Um, they carry about 80%, 15 dischargers of the um, carbon load to that plant. And so you think about if you can collect that material upstream, if you can get it before it gets diluted by all the rest of the wastewater, you could actually do something useful with that carbon. And so some of the things that, that actually the, the three of us and others have been talking about, and, and actually a lot of people now, is if you can um, not dilute the wastewater, and this gets back to the, the Swiss example too, and you can collect some of the energy from that waste material, then you could offset um, a reasonable amount of, of the, the utility's use of energy, and also the utility wouldn't have to use as much energy to treat that waste because it's not discharged anymore. So that's not a very quantitative answer. But <laughs> that's okay. 6.7, I think. <laughs> there we go. Have you seen that building in Evoc in Switzerland? Oh, so the nest it's is very a... very cool. Uh, oh, oh, I haven't been there. No. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. you should go. So, okay. It's very neat. We, yeah. we, ha <laughs> we have the... So uh, the head of process engineering at ETH Zurich and, and Evoc is doing a sabbatical in my lab. And so he likes to talk about it. And we, we put it up mm. and talk about design of the system. But I have not been there yet. Yeah. Oh, it's, so, it's very cool. Yeah. And so, yeah, one thing to, to Paige's point, um, just the uh, not, like, it's, it's, it's very hard to deal with things once we've uh, mixed them. And so there's a concept uh, from Amory Lovins from the Rocky Mountain Institute that he talked about in the design of buildings that I really liked uh, called tunneling the cost barrier. And, and the idea was that uh, if you think about energy efficient buildings, and this was just the con context he was working in, um, you could think about increasing energy efficiency and the, the costs associated with that. And so if I have a new building and I want to install 
uh, really energy efficient windows. Okay, I incur a cost for improved efficiency. And I want more natural lighting. I incur a cost for, for improved efficiency and so on. And you go through better insulation and these other factors. Uh, you're incurring cost. You get to a point at which you no longer need an HVAC system. And so all of a sudden cost drops dramatically. And then you can change the structural design of the building and cost drops dramatically. And so all of a sudden your improved efficiencies actually cost less. Hmm. And so to an extent, I think wastewater has been plagued by this. We have trillions of investment, like trillions of dollars of investment in the ground and we're locked into it. We can do nothing about it. But if we think outside the box and actually try and come up with uh, approaches that we can actually have solutions that eliminate the problem in the first place of, of mixed waste streams, like these decentralized mm -hmm. systems and like source separation of waste streams. And then the economics change dramatically. Hmm. That's interesting. All right, I want to make sure I let Mary ask some of the questions that you have for Jeremy. <laughs> um, so one of the questions I was thinking of as, as you were talking about uh, how context matters and, um, with uh, the waste recovery, and I, the projection with the U.S., it, you know, it looked like it wasn't going to move the needle much on, on nutrient um, or nitrogen um, uh, requirements. But that, this was based on maybe a, a projections of business as usual kind of ag systems, right? So we're forever trying to, I, I work with um, organic and sustainable growers, we're trying to um, improve, trying to convince growers <laughs> to improve nutrient uh, management mm. to be a little bit more sustainable, um, such as using cover, green manures, cover crops, intercropping, um, to sort of uh, create less leaky sort of e ecosystems. And so how might those, have you looked at different, uh, your model under different sustainability practices, and how might that impact um, your model? Sure. So, uh, so I think in, in general, that's maybe where the, the greatest bang for the buck can happen is if, if farmers uh, have an incentive or, or, or get on board with uh, kind of behavior change and altering practices. Um, and so, uh, and also if, if agricultural systems change. So we have a couple projects on multifunctional woody polyculture and, and this idea of perennial agriculture. And, yeah. um, and then we look at the impl environmental implications of that and changes in fertilization and so on. But um, so I think, I think there's tremendous potential there to have aquatic benefits, but also reduce fertilizer consumption. And if that's the case, then yes, we have the potential uh, that that 2% maybe becomes 4%, you know, something. But it's still, it's still going to be single digits. Um, whereas in terms of the aquatic implications, these changes could be double digits, like in, in terms of reducing reductions in... Uh, in uh, nutrient loading on, on surface waters. So they could have tremendous environmental benefits. Um, for resource recovery, I think, you know, in the US, I think some of the, the greatest benefits are coming up with, with novel systems that reduce the reliance on conventional processes that can be infrastructure intensive, energy intensive, chemical intensive. Because uh, as we look toward an uncertain future that we don't know, uh, let's say, you know, what the availability of these chemicals that are going to be required and the fate of phosphorus and potassium, um, then insulating ourselves from that by recovering resources and designing infrastructure specifically designed to manage our own resources makes a lot of sense. Uh, but it also creates local opportunities for businesses to sprout up, uh, to recirculate things locally. Um, and so you can have economic development in this sector uh, that that could have implications for like employment, property values, all sorts of things. Um, you know, one, one thing I keep, you know, often think about, we have some green infrastructure projects and we don't do a lot with green infrastructure, especially if we look at it like in the city of Chicago to infiltrate water, Chicago storms are so intense and, and you know, there's so much uh, impermeable surface. Green infrastructure won't have a tremendous impact on flooding. But what it does do is every time you put in green infrastructure, the property values in the area go up like 10 to 20%. Every time you plant a tree, property values go up and then people invest more in their properties around it. Uh, and so if we talk about like having more kind of green economies, it's not even necessarily that it's gonna transform the nutrient flow uh, through our, you know, this is gonna transform the nutrient flow through the United States. But what it can do is create these economies that are centered on like sound principles and kind of yeah, sustainably thought through. All right, good. Let's take another audience question. Okay. How crazy is it to devote so much effort and monies to addressing permitted discharges while agricultural runoff and wrinkles, wrinkles? are unregulated? 
I read it right. I read <laughs> <laughs> agricultural runoff and wrinkle. I don't know what agricultural wrinkles are. It was written Split. as drain tiles. <laughs> that makes more sense. That makes more sense. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that's better. <laughs> Auto correct. <laughs> okay. I would love to address ag if we can <laughs> do that. Um, yeah, I think, so, so that's part of the reason too. We, uh, so in, in our work, we focus on uh, generating perceived value. And so um, we don't propose something. So we, uh, during my PhD, I was exploring resource recovery. And we wrote kind of like, or I wrote my first kind of paper on this topic. And we put a really important sentence in there in the beginning that basically said, um, something to the effect of, like, we think resource recovery can have great implications and it's important, but we don't think it's appropriate everywhere. Uh, and you shouldn't assume that it is, uh, because it depends. It depends on the location, it depends on the implications. And so, um, where it can create value, I think it's worth doing. Um, now, if we're talking about you know, regulatory structures and national pollution discharge elimination system and uh, who's regulated and who's not, um, Regrettably, I don't know how much that's going to change for the foreseeable future. Anybody else want to tackle that one? I, well, I think it is a little crazy, but <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'm a little bit more optimistic than Jeremy. I, I do think it will change at some point. I think it has to. And so I think um, as we develop new technologies for the permitted um, dischargers right now, we can do it with an eye to applying some of those same scientific principles, I think, to, to the currently non-permitted, but maybe sometime permitted in the future entities like ag. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of the same principles that we use for uh, recovery, we can, um, and for removal of nutrients from wastewater, I think we can eventually apply to ag as well. Not all, but some. Yeah. Very good. Are you going to give us the next question while you're up there, Jeremy? There we go. Okay. What are the major challenges you face in encouraging nutrient recovery? And what kinds of public en engagement have you used? You have to go to me. So the challenges, uh, major challenges faced in encouraging nutrient recovery. Um, so, well, I can talk specifically within the realm of this project, this collaborative um, project yeah, that we if have you, going on. If you're on. allowed to tell us about it, right? yes, <laughs> please do. Please do. Um, so, some of the challenges. Um, well, the idea, the concept of the of the project is um, to utilize brewery wastewater. Breweries, uh, local breweries in the in the metro area um, are on the upswing. We have a lot of them, and they go through a lot of water, and so they're paying a lot in wastewater management fees, and so what we're trying to do is recover some of that water, um, use anaerobic digestion processes to create fuel energy, and then use the water from that s system into uh, to use in plant production, so hydroponic, um, indoor, urban ag kind of projects. And I, I guess that some of the logistical problems have just been getting the water <laughs> um, the right, I mean, it has to have the right properties for plant growth, and so we've struggled with that personally on our end. So pH adjustments, um, the water was really high in phosphorus, not enough nitrogen, so not um, not typically uh, ready for those kinds of systems. And so we've had to do some sort of adjustments with that. Lots of different production systems that didn't work in a nutrient film technique. We had to use hydroponic practices um, using a substrate so we can get some more of the mineralization. Um, and I think that the water, the, the chemistry changes depending on where, where we go and what kind of inputs the breweries are using and what kind of um, sanitizers and things that they're using. So there's lots of, of just the source of the water and what we're going to use it for and what needs to happen to it to make it suitable um, for food production. Was, those were all really big logistical issues that we're, we're still kind of um, trying to struggle with. As far as the public engagement piece, um, I know a number of the, the brewery industries are really excited about this potential to save money while also uh, reducing 
energy costs. We'll see if we can kind of get there. Right now, we're very, it's very proof of concept stage, I think. And we have interest from um, the horticultural sector as well. So there's interest, there's a lot of interest right now in urban agriculture in general and aquaponics and integrating these kinds of systems into the classroom for STEM learning. You know, we're challenged in Minnesota to do, to do garden, uh, garden edu based education because of our short season. So indoor ag kind of allows us, allows us to fill that, that gap as well. And so there's a lot of interest from just showing um, from an in ed educational sector, and we're working with a not-for-profit, Spark Y, uh, who has set up aquaponic modules in a number of the public school systems throughout the metro for demonstration and for teaching. And, it, and they're excited about this kind of, this aspect of, of recovering nutrients and, and using them for, for, for ag. So, so you, you mentioned a cradle-to-cradle -cradle kind of system. Anything else? Uh, Anything? Well, I guess one challenge um, on the the waste to energy side that we've run into is actually the breweries don't pay all that much money for their wastewater, <laughs> and the okay. um, but the city is more interested because if they mm. can get this going, then they actually reduce the load to the treatment plant. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. to a, a reasonable degree. And so we've actually been working with um, a group at the Carlson School of Management looking at um, what industries really would benefit from this from a financial um, side. And, and there are some industries in the, in the cities that we hadn't considered earlier that spend a tremendous amount of money on their wastewater um, and, and have you know sort of food-based waste streams that, that we could probably tackle. The uh, brewery that we've been working with, I think a lot of their um, impetus to, to embrace this project is, is just personal sort of environmental, their, their environmental ethos, I guess, is, is what's driving them. Um, and, and so they've been sort of fun to work with. And that's something that you can't quantify, you can't necessarily count on. But, but I think that what we've learned so far in the brewery industry, at least on the waste treatment side, we haven't had as many problems as, as Mary because we're not trying to grow, grow crops. Bacteria are a lot easier to grow <laughs> than crops. But, um, but I think all of these other um, waste streams that we've been looking at look like they'll, they'll work pretty well. Um, and the, the public engagement we've just started working on is we've been working with a sculptor um, who's going to be uh, working on an installation at, at a tap room, a local tap room, to mm -hmm. illustrate the, the system that we're, that. That awesome. we're putting together. <laughs> so, so that should That's be great. fun. Um, Are there yeah. logistical challenges in just getting the brewery wastewater to where you'd be using them for the crops. Is that an issue or? That's a yeah. key issue. I mean, yeah. it's, it's particularly right if you think of it at scale. Right, right now we've been doing things at the research scale. So yeah. it's been okay. working with very small volumes um, of water and it involves my graduate student driving over there with carboys and just <laughs> collecting, oh, yes. collecting the water, collecting them from, from, from Good old grad graduate. students. Um, what would we do with that? But yeah, that's, that's definitely, and basically we were just at the stage of can we get this to work? And yeah. then if we yeah. can now, we'll have to we'll have to think through some of these hurdles and and work with I think the industries in order to come up with um, a good solution for that. Well, and one other thing to add on that, um, we, we do have people um, on the project that are in policy, and one of the issues, and also the the folks from Carlson School are looking at kind of what would it take to incentivize different industries mm -hmm. to co-locate mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah. and what policies would need to be in place to allow them to co-locate right. um, mm -hmm. and to share waste streams um, as feedstocks. I think that, that in some locations, the local regulations are uh, carryovers from, from past practices and they don't necessarily embrace where we might want to be able to go. There are examples of something similar to this in Scandinavia, and they call them symbioses, okay. where you have one company's wastewater is used as the other company's source water. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, those examples do exist. That would be kind of exciting. Makes a lot of Not sense. Not for food production, but 
Yeah. You know. There's uh, the plant in Chicago too. Is, okay. So they, they do have mm -hmm. uh, wastewater that then they use to fire the pizza ovens and so on. So it's a number uh, of businesses okay. all co located. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about not so much for this kind of project, but from some of the examples you were 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 giving, Jeremy? I mean, there there is also the the kind of the ick factor, right? I mean, spreading urine on human urine on crop fields, is terribly appealing. Um, I mean, that must be a challenge in terms of getting public acceptance to to some of these processes. Absolutely. So I think I think there need to be economic incentives that drive it, and so. Um, so in a lot of cases, like what, where we've seen, aside from, you know, biosolids, for example, where um, potentially farmers can get essentially paid to, to take mm -hmm. nutrients, which is uh, usually a pretty good deal. Um, when we look at like the crystal products, like struvite, for example, uh, they're able to market it. It's mostly niche markets. So even like aquaculture or something like mm -hmm. that, and they can sell it for a higher value. Um, because, yeah, I would not... Yeah, I would not like take urine and go to a farmer and, and, and offer to offer that as a potential, um, you know, uh, nutrient source. When we go to uh, developing communities, in a lot of cases, like uh, the, that same ick factor exists, and so the expectation is for a lot of people or researchers or development agencies that uh, if you're going to someone who, who lives in uh, poverty and has low access to nutrients, that any access to nutrients would be favorably received. Mm -hmm. It's not the case. So. Um, even in those cases, we try and understand how can we, uh, how would we create perceived value from these resources? And in some cases, it means centralized collection and processing by an independent like entrepreneur or mm -hmm. company, and then they create a crystal product or they create some resource that farmers would accept or would be interested in. Um, and yeah, and that's that's critical to this uh, to to making this a reality is that you can't assume that whatever you're going to recover is going to be uh, well received by the community. Um, the other piece that, that we often bump up against is, so I, I teach sustainable design, and, 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 and a lot in my class, the students get to do the semester-long design project, and they come up with resource recovery, they come up with bioenergy, renewable energy, all different types of projects. And almost always, like, the technology they've designed is more expensive than the conventional technology, like, let's say, renewable energy in a particular scenario. And they said, no, no, this can't be. We know we have to switch to renewables. And so I was like, well, it's... And it's cheaper to do this, so why would they do renewables? Um, and so they, they, they'd choose it because they, they want to do something good for the environment. I was like, they want to spend $10 million <laughs> like, because <laughs> it's good for the environment. And so, no, you have to have incentives in place. You have to have policy incentives or tax incentives or something to, to warrant that switch yeah. uh, such that someone would actually do it. And so that's one of the big challenges we bump up against is this idea that, and in the beginning, especially with resource recovery, when it started to get traction, was that uh, the people who developed the technologies assumed that everyone would want it because it's better, it's inherently better for the environment, was the, kind of the pitch. Um, and then I'll just, for public engagement, I'll touch on like, so one, one thing we've tried to do is engage agriculture, and so we have local, very environmentally minded uh, farms, including like um, fruit farms. And so uh, they do farmer education, and so we work through them to try and work on their waste management system and then hope that they would. Uh, communicate that as people mm. became exposed. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, let's go back to the audience. How is climate change and reducing GHG emissions? <laughs> yes, thank you. Emissions factored into why people are pursuing this option. Climate change yeah. effects So, this? So, um, yeah, I'm happy to answer. Um, so, so in, in the wastewater industry too, there was a big push um, to mitigate greenhouse gases and reduce uh, greenhouse gases from wastewater treatment plants. Um, for a long time, we actually didn't have a great handle on, on what the major sources of greenhouse gases were. Like we didn't know that nitrous oxide was being emitted even from our conventional treatment processes in really high concentrations. Um, one or two percent you know, of the incoming nitrogen can leave as, as N2O. Um, and so and N2O is you know, hundreds of times worse than, than CO2, and so uh, it's quite a bad greenhouse gas. So when people think about uh, resource recovery, we can't actually guarantee that it's, uh, this idea is going to meaningfully reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and part of the reason is you're still going to consume materials, probably some chemicals, some energy. Uh, and so if, if you can be energy neutral or energy positive, okay, you're reducing probably fossil fuel consumption, depending on what your electricity supply is. But greenhouse gas uh, mitigation is probably 
from my perspective, not going to be a, a big driver or you're not going to have a huge impact. Uh, one of the things I like to point out for like wastewater design is if, if you were looking at the design of a treatment plant and you made design decisions based on greenhouse gases, um, you can very quickly end up spending like tens of thousands of dollars per ton of CO2 mitigated and you could instead pay a power plant $10 instead of 10000 and remove that same ton of CO2. So with large utilities, when we start to have this conversation, if, if we come up to that result, usually what I suggest is just buy all your operators' Priuses. They'll be delighted, and you'll mitigate greenhouse gases more for less. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Okay. Anybody want to add to that one, or should we? All right, I'm going to take one more audience. I'm going to take one more audience question and then we'll sort of sum up. Uh, do you have an idea on what the economics of implementing this technology would look like? What is the first major step in making this a reality? Um, so, so some of this is done at full scale. So in particular, like the struvite production is done at full scale and the economics are okay uh, relative to what the utility would have to do otherwise to, to meet permits. And so, we're still talking about at large facilities, like millions of dollars of investment, or, uh, but the economics, like relative to what they would have to do otherwise, can be slightly favorable, not, not much more than that. Um, when we look at wholesale re-envisioning of our wastewater treatment facilities, moving away from our aer aeration and then and nutrient mitigation, but instead doing like anaerobic processes and methane production, um, so try and be closer to energy neutral, and then recovery of nutrients. Um, we are still talking about, was the question about cost, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, we're still talking about probably comparable levels of capital investment. The difference is that the operating and maintenance costs have the potential to be dramatically different because of the revenue. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the operating costs could, could be, like you could get tremendous benefit out of that. And, and one of the things that makes economics work out a little better at a wastewater utility relative to let's say a bioenergy company or something like that when we talk about energy and other things, is that wastewater utilities may have access to low interest loans that make the economics much more favorable for, for this type of investment uh, as opposed to like um, uh, for-profit companies and so. But if I understood you correctly, I mean we're basically, if we don't start recovering particularly phosphorus, we're gonna run out. I mean it's a finite resource. And so at some point is it just gonna get so expensive you're yeah. Right. So it, it, yeah. So people would argue we're going to run out. I probably, I don't. I don't think we're going to run out. I think it's going to get really expensive. Exactly okay. that. So okay. so like we can get phosphorus out of seawater if we had to. It's just going to be really expensive. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we can get it off the continental shelf. It's just going to be really okay. expensive. And okay. so just like anything else, I think there's going to have to be that price pressure to yeah. incentivize doing this. And that and and that's one way to do it is that phosphorus prices go up or potassium prices go up. Other ways are to uh, I mean impose permits. Mm -hmm. um, other ones are, you know, to, yeah, to, uh, to financially, uh, to do nutrient trading systems in the region or something like that. And that's one thing Illinois passed a law, um, for example, that uh, the wastewater utility can do nutrient trading even with agriculture um, and so that they don't have to mitigate uh, such that if someone else does, and it's a much easier lift for, for ag to reduce nutrient yeah. loading. So yeah. it needs those kinds of yeah. incentives. Okay. So. I'd, I'd also say that it's in... Um, it's location specific. So where they've been successful in doing nutrient trading in Minnesota, it's because there was a plant that was already going to be doing a major upgrade and they took that opportunity to put a price on nitrogen and then they put in, they were able then to, to put in some trading. Um, but it was because that plant was already putting in a huge upgrade. and. If you look at the, the case of, say, Detroit versus the Twin Cities, Detroit is not going to pay or help uh, finance distributed wastewater treatment because they need more wastewater to the main wastewater treatment plant. Okay. And so, you know, as, as the city has sort of huh. declined in, in population and, and industrial activity, and here, the, um, the utility has a, a really unique program where they actually help finance some of these pretreatment systems or, or systems that will help offset some of the loading. And, and that then is a financial benefit because then they don't have to put in an upgrade. They don't have to expand. And so I think it's going to be very place specific. And so here things like that might make more sense 
because then they can offset expansion for a period mm -hmm. of time. Whereas in other places, it's not going to make sense. And so I, I think um, it, it's going to be something in the U.S. anyway that I think will happen bit by bit if there are um, alternative benefits that can be had by putting in a new system, then that new system might get put in. And, and that will, I think, see slowly roll out over the next 10 years or so. And then we might start seeing yeah. a change as perhaps regulations change. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, I could sit here all night and talk with the three of you, but they'll kick us off the stage soon. So any final thoughts before we close for the evening? Paige, any? Final well, thoughts. I, this has share. been fun. I, this has I been think. Fun. Uh, <laughs> okay. Mary, you're good. Jeremy, any last words? Okay. Well, I, I wish you best of luck with your pro proposal. I hope it, it gets funded. Thank you. And I'll look forward to visiting this brewery and, you know, <laughs> seeing how that all works out. We all will, right? Very good. Well, thank you all for, for your participation this evening. Thank you, Jeremy, for a great presentation. And thank you all for your participation, if you're still out there. I think they're still out there. Okay, thank you.